Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with respect to my friend um, from Labour, I don't think this is dog whistling. I think this is sirens. This is a siren to their supporters. This is all about an ideological position, nothing to do with evidence. Uh, it's not dog whistling at all. It's about making it loud and clear to National Party supporters, perhaps even their funders, that they will attack the most vulnerable families, do damage to the children of the poorest families in order to win themselves a few extra votes. And that is where this national government is coming from. Sir, I don't think that it is an extreme position at all to say that this is a dreadful piece of legislation. It is an abusive piece of legislation. And it is misconceived out of the traditional national parties. And I don't say this lightly, but I think it's true. Pathological hatred of beneficiaries in this country. Pathological hatred of the most poorest and the most vulnerable families in this country. And I'm appalled that a, a, a minister, a minister who was herself once a beneficiary, as was I, is responsible for the introduction of this legislation, a direct attack on her own community, on her own community minister, which seems deliberately designed, deliberately designed to build on the failures of past national-led governments in the area of so-called welfare reform. Now, I, I lived through the first tranche of this in the early and mid-90s when I was a beneficiary at that time, and I worked with beneficiary families at that time, and the mother of all budgets that cut welfare spending and cut the DPB by some 40 per cent, leaving those families, hundreds of thousands of New Zealand families, at the very bottom of the breadline, barely able to feed themselves at all and pay their rent and power, purposely, purposely put in that position by the national government. They're intending to do that again, and you can see how that's happening in this legislation. But, sir, I want to talk about the evidence and the... the, the whether, well, whether there is any, actually, for the intention of this legislation. And so let's start with the regulatory impact statement for the bill. And it says this. There is no research currently available which accurately quantifies the size of the behavioural response from these changes in policy. No evidence at all of any behavioural change. And this prevents, it goes on to say, estimates with the degree of accuracy required from being made of the number of people who will move from benefit to work over a year as a result of the changes. So there is no evidence to show that the policy will make any changes in people's behaviour and therefore there is no estimate about how many people will be moved from benefits to work. So this just confirms what the Minister said, uh, confirmed in the question that I asked him last, uh, last week, that they don't know who the target is. They don't know who they're talking about when they want to move people from benefits to work. Just this, yeah, just some... Uh, some faceless families, actually. Faceless families to national. They're certainly not fa faceless to me, because I was once one of those families, and I still deal with those families. Clearly, the National Party does not, and certainly not this minister. So, in other words, the government has not the faintest idea whether or to what extent this bill will achieve its stated objectives. It's a pure form of ideological beneficiary bashing without a shred of evidence that anything in this bill will actually work. The regulatory impact statement reveals some interesting comments from Treasury and the Ministry of Health about aspects of the bill. And, you know, that's a euphemistic way of putting it because the actual documents show that Treasury opposed the work testing of sickness beneficiaries. Treasury opposed the work testing of sickness beneficiaries, one of the cornerstones of this legislation, because, as we heard earlier, it will have sickness beneficiaries working for less than $1 an hour once their earnings exceed 80 bucks. What, less, less than $1 an hour for those who are ill. Less than $1 an hour for those who are suffering from illness for which they need, to, they need to be made well and they need support so that they can be well and therefore go and earn in better jobs that pay better money that can support them and their families. But no, this government is going to force them out so that they will end up earning less than $1 an hour. And this is New Zealanders in the 21st century with a government with its mind still really in Dickens. Really, they've still got their mind back in, in Dickens' day. 
Now, as for the as for the Ministry of Health, I can understand why they're concerned, because they, there's already a creaking public health service that will struggle, that will struggle to cope with an additional 49,000 extra doctor's visits a year from settlers beneficiaries. 49,000 extra doctor visits a year that the public pay for. The public pay for. And not, not to treat these people, not to provide medicines and support, not to provide assistance to help them get well, but simply to fulfil the bureaucratic requirements of a government that is putting in place this necessity for them to go and spend all this money and the public to spend all this money so that this government can say they're going to work test and continue to punish beneficiaries, and particularly sickness beneficiaries. How will so much for frontline services, so much for putting money in frontline services, 49,000 extra bureaucratic doctor's visits a year that will do nothing for those sickness beneficiaries, and this national government is costing the taxpayer hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then there's the Attorney General report um, under Section 7 of the Bill of Rights Act, which says, I conclude that by introducing a part-time work test for DPB um, SBs and not for the widow's benefit or the widow's allowance, women alone, sorry, DPB, that uh, the bill is inconsistent with the Bill of Rights Act and that that inconsistency cannot be justified that it is discriminatory against a woman because of her circumstances and that that discrimination cannot be justified. Now, <laughs> the, the, the Minister seems to be suggesting in answers to um, questions last week in, in public that somehow it's fair and reasonable uh, for the government to make that discrimination. But we know that that is not true. We know that that is not true. And that this is not an argument either to increase the work testing regime to women alone or to those on widows. That what this is is an argument for saying why should women who are, find themselves in a particular kind of situation, mostly due not to anything that they have done or their own, or their own fault, be subjected to work tests, um, a discriminatory work test that will impact severely on them and their children. It cannot be justified. In the case of sickness beneficiaries, of course, we oppose the work testing because of this ridiculous situation where people who are ill end up earning less than $1 an hour. Um, and it's compulsory work. So if they do not take the job that will earn them less than $1 an hour, their benefit will be cut. So this is not an option that these people will have. They will be forced into this work, forced into earning less than $1 an hour. And in that regard, this indicates this shows that this government, John Key's government, has reneged on a promise it made in its election manifesto. It has broken another promise, one to add to the many. Because this government's policy was that the abatement threshold for all benefits would increase from $80 to $100 a week. But that's not what they're delivering. They're only delivering that for some, and the some who will miss out, those who will miss out, are some of our most vulnerable, those on sickness benefits. We know from the evidence in Australia, when they introduced a similar policy of work testing in 2006, that there were subsequent reports that looked at the effectiveness of their work testing policy showed that it failed. It made no difference whatsoever to people who are moving on or off the disabilities benefit, the equivalent there. It made no difference at all to those people's needs because people will move on to the benefit when jobs are scarce and they need that support and they will move right off again as they did in the, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, they'll move right back off again when those jobs become available. And we know in a time of recession, as we are in right now, the impacts on the lowest income first, those jobs are not there. So finally, sir, I want to um, address the provisions that relate to the unemployment benefit. This is a benefit that's paid to people who are actively seeking work, and quite rightly so. That is the whole point, and they are. But this bill requires them to be interviewed at 12 months after receiving the benefit and to re reapply after that date. But if this government was serious about assisting these people into work, why wouldn't they do it earlier? 
Why wouldn't you do it at three months when people have had a chance to try to figure out what the job market is like, they've had some time for support? Why not do it at three months? Why do it at 12? Because actually it's got nothing to do with trying to support them into work. All it is is another bureaucratic measure that will cost more money, will punish people, will make them look, make it look like this government is doing something about beneficiary issues when in fact all they're doing is abusing Order. these people. This minister